Oh America, a country that is truly the most influential in the history of the world. Although being relatively the youngest world power in the world as it existed for only 247 years as of making of this video. From the pioneers of science and culture to the push for freedom and democracy, the United States is the nation that contributed a lot to how the world is today. In this series of videos, we are going to look into the history of, of this great nation and talk about 46 people who made this nation what it is today. That being, looking into leadership of all 46 presidents of the United States of America and how they impacted the further development of, of America and the world. In this episode, we shall look into the presidency of the first president of the United States, George Washington. Before we can look into the presidency of George Washington, I think it is necessary to look a little bit into the background of the first American president. George Washington, born February 22, 1732, and died December 14, 1799, prior to becoming president, was a military officer in the Virginia Colonial Regiment of the British Colonial Army and fought during the French and Indian War. And later, he became a big supporter of independence for the 13th colonies and was one of the founding fathers of the United States as he was appointed by the Second Continental Congress, which he was part of, to be the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. And with his wise leadership, he was able to provide one of the most crucial inputs in defeating the British Imperial Army and winning independence for America. Due to this incredible background and his enormous popularity in American society, in the first ever presidential elections, which took place in 1788 to 1789, the only election in American history which took place in two different years, he was able to win 69 electoral votes from all of the eligible states. John Adams became his vice president as he came in second with 34 electoral votes, as many electors from each state picked him as their second choice. The electoral college system during that time, and still today, is a very weird system of fitting a head of state, but back then it was even more weird, and I'm not going to go into how this entire system worked, as it demands a entire video of its own. In 1792, definitely under no pressure and definitely voluntarily, he decided to run for a second term, and again, he won unanimously, getting all of the state's electoral votes, being the only president to win all of the electoral votes from each state. Nobody would ever come close to George Washington in terms of electoral results. Fun fact, although under the US Constitution, the time was set on March 4th for the presidential inauguration to take place, Due to difficulties of travel and the fact that the newly established U.S. House of Representatives was not able to reach a quorum until April, led to George Washington only being able to be inaugurated on April 30th. During his first term in office, George Washington used his executive powers to firstly re-establish the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and rename it to the Department of State. That is due to the fact that from period of March 4th till July 27th, the United States did not have a foreign affairs ministry, as it was temporarily abolished after implementation of the Constitution to give the way to a new government under the Constitution. New York politician John Jay was made temporary Secretary of State until Thomas Jefferson arrived from France. On August 7th, the Department of War was reinstated with General Henry Knox becoming the first Secretary of War. The Financial Office was reinstated on September 2nd and renamed as Department of Treasury. Washington appointed Alexander Hamilton as the first Secretary of Treasury. After his first pick for that position, financier and founding father Robert Morris Jr. Alexander Hamilton instead. In September of 1789, Congress established the position of Attorney General of the United States to serve as the legal advisor of the President. Washington appointed Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph as the first Attorney General of the United States. 
These four positions became collectively known as the cabinet, and this terminology is used to this day. Due to the rise of political parties and infighting inside of George Washington's cabinet, the cabinet would see changes by the beginning of George Washington's second term. One of them would happen after Thomas Jefferson left the position of Secretary of State due to massive disagreements with Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton. Although the cabinet is a vital part of any presidential administration, according to historian Forrest MacDonald, he, George Washington, was in practice his own foreign secretary and, and war secretary. So, in these two areas, he did things by himself without any much help. According to the US Constitution, the US President has a right of veto power, that being that any legislation disliked by the President can be overturned. In his entire eight years of being President of the United States, George Washington exercised this power only twice. First time he used it against the Apportionment Bill of April 5, 1792, which aimed at providing guidelines for the number of congressional representatives based on the results of the 1790 census. George Washington viewed the bill as unconstitutional due to belief that it did not divide the state population evenly when determining representation. The second time when President Washington used his veto power was on February 28, 1797 when he vetoed a bill that aimed at cutting the size of the army. According to Article 3 of the US Constitution, which established the judicial branch of the US government, the President was responsible for making appointments to the Supreme Court. Due to the fact that prior to George Washington becoming President such a body did not exist, George Washington was responsible for filling the entire Supreme Court with justices. Due to the fact that the original US Constitution left a lot of aspects of this body vague, in September of 1789, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was passed by both House and Senate and signed by the President, George Washington. And this law defined the Supreme Court to have six justices, one being Chief Justice and the rest being Associate Justices. In 1789, George Washington appointed John Jay, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Founding Father, as the Chief Justice, and as Associated Justices, he appointed George Rutledge, former governor of South Carolina and a founding father, William Cushing, Massachusetts Chief of Chief Justice, James Wilson, Scottish born lawyer and a founding father, John Blair Jr., founding father and a politician from Virginia, and James Irabell, English born judge from North Carolina. In total, George Washington would later make four more appointments to the Supreme Court as in subsequent years certain members of the Supreme Court would resign from their position. George Washington additionally made 28 appointments to the dis district courts as he had a right to do it under the Article 4 of the Constitution. Under the presidency of George Washington, many actions were taken in the fields of domestic affairs. One of the biggest issues that President Washington faced was the question of a permanent capital of the United States. The problem was that, for the longest time, the capital was on the territory and the jurisdiction of a state, and the security of the federal government was fully in the hands of the state governments. Due to that fact, after looking into many different options, 30 locations to be exact, it was decided in 1790 that a new capital would be constructed near the Potomac River on the land donated to the federal government by the state governments of Maryland and Virginia, with temporary capital being moved from New York City back to Philadelphia for the next 10 years. The construction of the White House started in 1792, with the first cornerstone of the Capitol being laid by George Washington in 1793. The other issue, which was also relevant to the new American nation, was the question of the economy and trade. Due to the fear that local manufacturers in America wouldn't be able to compete with British goods imported into the Young Republic, in 1789 Congress reached a compromise on the issue of trade and passed the Tariff Act of 1789 that imposed 
import duties on goods coming into the country. In subsequent years, import duties made up 87% of the total government revenue between the years 1789 till 1800. To enforce the tariffs, the United States Customs Service and points of entries were established, as well as a so-called revenue marine to enforce the The main economic policy followed under the Washington administration was the American School of Economics, also known as Hamiltonian Economics, named after Alexander Hamilton we mentioned earlier. The central policies under this system were the support of industry and advocacy of protectionism as opposed to free trade, particularly for protection of infant industries and, and those facing import competition from a foreign power. Next, create a physical infrastructure, government finance of internal improvements to speed commerce and develop industry. This involved the regulation of privately held infrastructure to ensure that it meets the nation's needs. And lastly, create a financial infrastructure, which is a government-sponsored national bank to issue currency and encourage commerce. This involved the use of sovereign power for the regulation of credit, to encourage development of the economy and to deter speculation. For a large amount of import duties was, was making a, a big revenue pouring into the treasury, it was not enough to corner the spending. And that caused the budget deficit forcing the Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton to institute a tax on distilled spirits. The tax was later implemented in 1791 and signed into law by President Washington. These moves were unfortunately unpopular in western parts of Pennsylvania, where a three-year-long insurrection against the US government took place by a local population, and this insurrection will be known in history as Whiskey Rebellion from 1791 to 1794. In its conclusion, US military, under the direct command of President Washington, and General Washington was actually, due to that, one of the only two American presidents in American history to ever take direct command of the military in the battlefield. And in process of fighting, George Washington was able to put the rebellion down. One of the most vital things that also occurred under Washington's presidency was emergence of modern forms of political parties, those being the Federalists, the proponents of Hamiltonian economics, federal form of governance and easing relationship with Britain, and its main leaders were founding father figures such as John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. The other political party getting prominence was a party of former anti-federalists, people who opposed the ratification of the US Constitution, being the Democratic Republican Party. It means it, it, its main position was classical liberal economics, free trade, decrease of power of the federal government, and Francophilia, meaning they really, really, really liked France a bit too much. The main leaders of the Democratic Republican Party were forty father figures such as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Under presidency of George Washington I, ten amendments to the U.S. constitutions were passed by the Congress and ratified by the majority of states of the Union. These ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution are also known as the Bill of Rights because they guarantee freedom and liberty of every U.S. citizen, such as, and not limited to, freedom of speech, right to carry a firearm, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and so on and so on. In early America, slavery was still a prominent issue that divided U.S. society and got them into debates on ethics of such practices. Little was able to be done on that front primarily due to the fact that sovereign states relied on institution of slavery for the plantation-based economy and opposed any moves to end slavery. Under Washington administration, two acts were passed on the question of slavery. That being a sad and horrible Fugitive Slave Act that made it illegal to assist escaping slaves and, and established a legal framework to return escaped slaves to their masters, 
in the hour act, uh, a pretty good one, not really bad one to say the least, uh, was the Slave Trade Act of 1794 that limited US involvement in slave trade and ended the participation in the slave trade in terms of exporting slaves. The last major issue on the domestic front for George Washington was the series of conflicts with Native American tribes in the Northwestern Territories granted to the United States under the Treaty of Paris. The conflict is known as the Northwest Indian War, which lasted from 1785 to 1795, and it ended with a U.S. victory and full incorporation of that land into the United States. And that, and if you don't know where that is located, it's the area around Ohio, Indiana, and states like that. In terms of the foreign policy, George Washington employed a neutral foreign policy, avoiding involvement in international affairs. One of the biggest events that happened on the international arena of that time was the French Revolution of 1789, under which a thousand-year-old French monarchy came to an end with the establishment of the First French Republic. Although initially it was widely supported by the American public, that unconditional support ended with the news of massacres and violence caused by the revolutionaries in France, which led to the division in the American public on the perception of the French Revolution. Another major foreign policy issue of the day was the relationship with Great Britain and how British Navy seized American ships in the Atlantic, supplied Native Americans in the war against the Americans, as well as occupying territories in the Great Lakes. These issues led to some Democratic Republican politicians, like Thomas Jefferson, to push for a war with Great Britain over these issues. To solve this issue, the Treaty of Amity, Commerce and Navigation between His Britannic Majesty and the United States of America, popularly known as the Jay Treaty, named after John Jay, who negotiated the treaty with the British, was signed between the two sides in 1794, which was able to make it easier for US to trade and getting Britain to withdraw from six forts in the Great Lake region, effectively handed it over to the Americans. Although this treaty solved a lot of issues America was facing, the main problem of imprisonment of US sailors continued and would set groundworks for the events to come. <coughs> That's what's called foreshadowing. Lastly, one more foreign policy issue resolved under the Washington administration was the border between the US and Spanish colonial positions, i.e. border between Florida and Georgia. That was defined by Pinckney Treaty of 1795. In conclusion, although George Washington's presidency did have some drawbacks. He is regardless still one of the best presidents America has ever had, as he is the one who laid foundation of the American nation and its institutions that still serves its tasks today as well as strengthening the United States for the challenges to come. Until he'd rake her fore and aft, the lovers couldn't steer. And then he showed the foe the heels of the Yankee privateer. We sailed and we sailed and kept good cheer, for not a British frigate.